If you'd like to open your Bibles, this morning's scripture reading will come from the book of Mark, chapter 7. Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Mark 7, 1 through 9. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other ways, other things which they have received and hold like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many others such things you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. Morning, brethren and friends. We're happy to see you here. Beautiful Lord's Day morning. We're grateful for the opportunity to assemble together, to worship together this morning. We enjoyed the last hour in our Bible classes, and we're thankful to all of our teachers for teaching in the last hour, and all uh, we're here, and we're uh, thankful now this hour uh, to be able to worship together in spirit and in truth. Thankful to the men who have led us in worship up to this point, and I thank Jason for finding the songs that he found. I sent him the sermon title a couple of days ago, but I didn't think you'd really be able to find songs to go along with that, but he did, and I certainly uh, appreciate that as we talk about traditions uh, this morning. But once again, we're so thankful that all of you are here. Hope that you have a, a wonderful day and all that you do, but certainly our worship in this hour is what will be needed to uh, springboard us into the rest of the day and the rest of the week as we continue to strive to live faithful to God in all that we do. We're talking about traditions this morning. We're going to begin in Mark chapter 7. If you want to open your Bible there or leave it open there, uh, we will not stay in Mark chapter 7. We'll We'll bounce around a little bit, but uh, we will begin there as we, as we talk about traditions. You know, some traditions are relatively new, uh, while other traditions have been around for, for years, for centuries. Uh, not all traditions are wrong. Not all traditions are sinful. We have to be careful because we can get it uh, in our minds that uh, tradition is wrong. Jay read our scripture reading from Mark chapter 7 verses 1 through 9 and you may or may not have counted but four times in our text it talks about traditions in the New King James text it does at least twice it talks about uh, the uh, the tradition uh, or the traditions of the elders once it talks about the traditions of men and then of course they were changing it in verse 9 or rejecting the commandments of God so they could keep their tradition. So tradition can be wrong, it can be sinful, but it, it's not sinful just because it's tradition. That's important that we, we remember that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I personally don't believe it's possible to not have tradition or traditions. Whatever you do uh, is tradition. Um, this is just simply what you do. Again, we must make sure that we're staying with the Word of God and what we're doing when we teach how to worship, how to be saved, and how to serve. But for example, we assemble on the first day of the week because we see that as the example of the first century church in the book of Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2. And God just told us to assemble together on the first day of the week. He did not give a time. We here at Wood Avenue do it at 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and 5 uh, PM. That's, that's kind of our, our tradition. Now, we're not changing the Word of God. If we did it on another day of the week and neglecting Sunday, that's changing the Word of God. So we're not changing it in, in any way, but it, it is the, the tradition here. We know that it's um, at these times, and it's helpful because, because we know, right? We, we know what time to, to, uh, to be at church. Some might say, well, we're going to change every week so we won't fall into tradition. You know, one week we'll assemble at 8, and the next week at 9, and the next week at 10. Well, 
That's your tradition. Your tradition is to change. Uh, so, uh, again, you, you can't not have tradition. It's just whatever you do. And not all tradition is, is sinful. Not all tradition is wrong. But, of course, some is. Uh, when we bind uh, tradition as if it's the Word of God and we require of people what God does not require, uh, we never want to go beyond the Word of God, nor do we want to stop short of the Word of God. We just want to be right in line with the Word of God, with the Bible. Um, if uh, we, we, again, we bind upon others um, uh, our, our traditions, then, then we're doing what we see in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 9, and requiring from people what God has not. Now, there's nothing wrong in of itself in what they were doing, uh, in, in, in a sense. Uh, you know, I, I wash my hands before a meal. Uh, you know, and, and, and we, we wash our dishes and stuff like that. But when we start, again, binding it and we start uh, requiring this, and they were doing it at the expense of the Word of God and changing the Word of God. So let's, let's notice together some traditions of the Jews, starting with our text in Mark chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. Again, we see that uh, here they are with their own traditions, and Jesus uh, is condemning them for it. Jesus it talks about Isaiah, verses 7 through 9. Isaiah prophesied of you, you hypocrites. Have you ever considered there are certain uh, statements by Jesus, condemnations by Jesus, sermons by Jesus, Paul, Peter, and others that probably not here, but in many church buildings uh, around the world, uh, whether it be within churches of Christ or not, there are probably many that our Lord would not be allowed to preach or the Apostle Paul, or Peter. How many, if Jesus himself were to stand up and give this message, you hypocrites, they would say, no, it's time for you to go. You can't preach that here. But Jesus was, he, he, he came out and he taught them what they were doing, what they were doing wrong, and how Isaiah prophesied about this because they were changing the Word of God. They were not respecting the Word of God and they were binding the traditions of the elders, again, twice in our text, traditions of men, once in our text, rejecting the Word of God so they could have their own traditions, again, in our text. So we see in verses 3 through 5, specifically, that uh, here, here was a problem. These traditions were becoming to them what was authority. Notice some other traditions. We will not notice all the traditions, but I've picked out a few that we can find in the Bible of things that they were doing, the Jews in the first century. And let me say this. It's not to say all of the Jews across the board were doing this. But these are what some of them were doing that we can read uh, in the Bible. Such as in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. If you want to go ahead and open your Bible there, notice how they were defiling uh, the temple. Twice in the Gospel accounts, you find Jesus um, cleansing the temple is how we usually describe it when he goes in uh, in, a, in a forceful way with the, uh, with, with the, uh, the, the, the cord, the whips, uh, overturning the tables and the money changers because as we see in John chapter 2 beginning in verse 13, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple uh, with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold the doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. They were taking the temple. As you know, it goes all the way back to the book of Exodus when it was the tabernacle, with God's plan, God's instructions for the tabernacle. In the days of Solomon, they build the temple. This temple, of course, was not Solomon's temple. That was destroyed in Babylonian captivity. This is the one that Herod built for them. But they were not respecting this, this sacred place. They were not respecting uh, this place where the priest would go into and the high priest once a year and the, the holy place and the holy of holies. They, 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 they were not having a respect for God's word. And what we're going to do throughout this lesson, we're going to notice how that can apply today. And if we're not careful, we'll, we'll do the same today. Some would use churches simply in the same means and matters they would then. How, how can I make a little money off of this? Coming up with own traditions, own ways uh, to do something that it was not designed to do. At one time in our history of our nation, and I, it may still be today, I don't know, I've not checked it. You can check it if you would like. But at one time in the history of our nation, religion was in the top ten ways uh, to get rich in America. 
And a lot of people have done that, have they not? And uh, in, in ways that are sinful uh, even. How sad is that? But people see this opportunity. Um, if they're certainly not uh, interested in God or obeying God. I'll never forget we were on a mission trip and we happened to be with a group and we showed up at the building where we were uh, preaching in a meeting and uh, the next day we showed up at the same location and one of the local men in the community, a, a, a wise salesman, saw uh, an opportunity and he took advantage of it. He set up right there on the road with his fruit stand and his vegetable shop because here's a Here's a busload of people. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make a little money off of them. And I, I, I don't think anything was wrong with what he was doing. I'm not making a direct comparison. But I always think about what these people were doing in John 2 with the temple, defiling the temple. If we're not careful, we'll use the church for what it was not meant. Notice in Matthew chapter 15, verses 3 through 6, they were no longer honoring their parents in Matthew chapter 15 verses 3 through 6. Matthew's account of the same when Jesus said, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? There we are again. Nothing wrong with tradition. Unless the tradition is sinful or unless they're binding it as the word of God. For God commanded saying, honor your father and your mother and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever uh, profit you might have received from me is a gift of God. And he need not honor his father or mother. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Matthew chapter 15, verses 3 through 6. So here they are, binding their traditions, changing the word of God. Uh, you can say I've given a scripture reference in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 16, going back to the... Law of Moses and the Ten Commandments, the second time it was given, the first time back in Exodus chapter 20. I mean, this, this was a staple. This was the beginning when Moses was on that mountain in Exodus chapter 20. And he's given the Ten Commandments. Now, there were many more than just these ten, of course, but these commandments given on the tablets of stone, kind of the foundation, if you will, of who Israel would be as a nation. They were taught and told and instructed to honor their father and their mother. And Jesus is saying, you're not doing that. You're not doing it. Remember, they're still under the law of Moses at this time. This is before the church was established. This is before Christianity. You're not doing that. You're changing it. You're changing the commandments of God so you can follow your own traditions. Well, let's stay in the book of Matthew and jump over to Matthew chapter 19. We discussed this last week uh, when we talked about uh, the family and the home. But you notice in uh, Matthew chapter 19, another area in which they were changing, and you see would change quite often today, is they were changing God's law on marriage to their own traditions. Beginning in verse 7, they said, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? In verse 8, Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. This is what they wanted. This is what some of them were practicing or perhaps close family members practicing. So let's come up with our own rules. Let's come up with our own ways. Let's come up with our own traditions so we can put a twist on the Word of God in the way that we want it. Let me mention this. This is kind of a, it goes along with the sermon, but it's not on the PowerPoint. So I, I listen to talk radio sometimes, and over the last couple of weeks, I've heard a commercial on a local um, radio station, and uh, I've heard this commercial two or three times, and it's one of these commercials about investing in gold, and I'm not here to give you financial tips or anything like that. But this one is, they're trying to tie it in with the Bible and they're trying to tie it in with, uh, in, in that route. I think even if you want information, you're to text the word faith to a number or something like that. But the guy, kind of going back to our, sir, our lesson this morning in Bible class um, with the lawyer, knowledge but heart full of sin, the guy on the commercial, he's quoting correctly from the book of Haggai. The gold is mine and the silver is mine. But he's applying that to Haggai, saying that of, this is why it's important on gold. And I thought, oh, wow, you have really just taken that verse as far away from its original meaning as you could to try to make a little money, right? There we go. Tradition. That's God. That's God reminding the people that everything belongs to him. But yet they found a way to take a verse out of the Bible and try to make people believe in something that they're selling. 
It's, it's all too often. It's all too common. We have to be careful. Open your Bible to the book of Exodus chapter 20. Again, this goes back to the Ten Commandments, the original time that they were given to the first generation, the generation who would eventually die out in the wilderness. When we see the tradition of the Jews, they were, they were changing worship. They were changing worship to idol worship. God said in verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Notice what God is saying here. Now remember, remember the setting. Moses, the great leader of Israel, has led his people, Israel, out of Egypt. And for all of those years that they were in Egypt, was it, what, 400 years or something like that, that they were in Egypt, you know, that, that the Egyptian way, their gods are out of worship, that, that rubs off on them. Com the community, we live in it, we work in it, we go to school in it, and it's there, right? So we see and hear things that, that influences us. That's why we must stay in the Word to make sure we're always walking with God and not with uh, whatever else is going on out there. Well, that was in them. While Moses, isn't it something that while Moses was getting these very commands of, of no idol worship, no carved image, no graven image, that his brother Aaron and the others, they were making a golden calf. Isn't that something? That was in them. That's, that, that had influenced them. And we would say that that would plague the people of Israel uh, for, for, for their history. It would continue to plague them. God told them, I'm your only God. I'm the one who created you. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. Worship me and me only. But, but here they are going uh, to these idols and these idols way of, the idol way of worship. Now, we in this area, we might not be as accustomed to seeing idols in some areas of the world, you see them everywhere. I mean, they're just, they're all over and people are bowing down to them and people are, are worshiping them. You know, we, we do see it. We have it here, but we might not see it on every corner as in some places of the world. But let me ask you this. What if you are the idol in idol worship? What if it's all about you rather than God? What if it's all about me? rather than God. God is the center of our worship. Not carved images and not self. God is the center of our worship. Now open your Bible to the book of John chapter 8. In John chapter 8 we notice another tradition is that they placed everything about who they were. Some of them, again not all, but some of them placed everything about who they were according to their family ancestry. In John chapter 8, Jesus is having a lengthy uh, discussion uh, with some. And it, it's about Abraham. Now remember the Jews, the people of Israel, they are descendants of Abraham. We're going to notice in a moment Genesis 12. That all goes back to Genesis chapter 12. So rightfully so, they are born into the family of God by being descendants of Abraham. It's no longer today. We're not in that time period. We're not... In Judaism, we are in the Christian period of time. We're born into the family of God a different way by choice. Spiritual birth, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, by water and the Spirit. But notice their tradition, verse 33, they answer Jesus, we are Abraham's descendants. We're going to notice, well, let's, let's, I'm going to go back to verse 33 in a moment. But verse 33, we're Abraham's descendants. Verse 39, they answer Jesus, Abraham is our father. And then again in verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham? To them, it was all about Abraham. It was all about Moses. You know, words only. Not action, not commitment, but we have the blood of Abraham. The covenant was given to him. It's all through him. It's all about him. And just because of who we are, that's, that's everything that's important. Nothing else uh, is important. We're going to tie that again uh, in again in a moment to Christianity. But go back to verse 33. They answered Jesus and said, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. Can you read that verse without laughing? They've been in bondage to everyone. I mean, the Egyptians, the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, at the time that they say this, they're not free. They're in bondage to the Romans. 
Their entire history, they were in bondage to someone. Every time they did wrong, every time they did wrong, they've been in bondage. You see how easy it is to, 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 for things to be blurred if we're not careful. And here they are believing that we're descendants of Abraham. That's all that matters. And we've never been in bondage to anyone. And they're not realizing what is truth. Consider just for a moment the history of the Jews. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, God gave this promise to, to Abraham. And, and from that promise, when you think about the, the history of the Jews, that uh, in him all the nations would be blessed. You see the promise of circumcision, and, uh, and the covenant, I should say, of circumcision in Genesis chapter 17. Again, it's also established in the law of Moses. Remember in John chapter 1 and verse 17, it talks about Moses the lawgiver. So what we're doing, we're going to, just a quick history, Galatians chapter 3 and 4 would tie all that together. A number of places in the New Testament would tie it together, but these two chapters especially tie it all together for us when you consider Genesis 12, Genesis 17, and Moses the lawgiver in John chapter 1. Galatians chapter 3 and 4 would tie that together, bridging it together, our understanding at least, of Judaism to Christianity. Christianity is not against Judaism. Christianity came out of Judaism. That was God's plan. It has always been God's plan. And God fulfilled that plan in Jesus, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. It's important that we realize that and that we understand that uh, to understand our history. Spiritually speaking, our ancestors are the Jews. That was God's plan. But now God's plan was fulfilled and that system is no longer. And that's what a lot of people have not understood. Still trying to hold to it, whether it be in all or in part. I made that point because now I want to transition into traditions of Christians. Is it any wonder that we see today some of the same traditions that we just discussed? For example, they might say, I'm Abraham's seed, I'm Abraham's descendant. How easy is it for people today to say, I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the Lord's church. I'm a member of the New Testament church that you read about in the Bible. The Lord added me to his church, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. That's wonderful. That, 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 we can't go to heaven without it. But if I'm like the Jews and I'm basing it all on that with nothing to follow, not living it out, not continuing in faithfulness, then really I'm no different than what they were saying in John chapter 8. No different at all. Open your Bible to Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11, we talked about how some of the Jews, they were priding themselves on having uh, the covenant uh, that was given to Abraham. And then again with Moses, they were priding themselves on having the law of circumcision. As we noticed, we refer to it at least in Genesis 17, uh, where circumcision was part of that covenant. But notice what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. In Jesus, you were also circumcised. Now, this is speaking to Christians in the Christian period of time. You were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Sometimes it's the same mindset is there. The Jews, hey, we're Abraham's descendants. We have the law. We've been circumcised. Christians, hey, I'm in the family of God. Jesus has added me to, added me to the church. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, I've been baptized. That's wonderful. It's part of it. It's not all of it. And we cannot get into this mindset that our traditions say once baptized, always saved. It's once baptized, always saved. If, according to the book of 1 John, we continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. Then go back to John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Jesus is in Samaria with this woman from Samaria. And uh, the discussion has turned to him being the prophet. And the discussion goes to worship. She asks about worship. He tells her, you're wrong. The Samaritans are wrong. You're worshiping incorrectly. There's one of your proof texts that not all worship is acceptable to God. John 4 and Genesis 4. Remember those two four chapters. Genesis 4, John 4, both would teach us that not all worship is acceptable to God. But he tells her in verses 23 and 24, you must worship uh, in spirit and in truth. There's a right way to do it. If there's a right way, there's a wrong way. But again, here's where our tradition, this kind of ties into our Good Samaritan study uh, back in the 9 o'clock hour here in the auditorium. I must be careful to let my traditions of men make whoever, myself or anyone else, believe that it's church only. As long as I go to worship, as long as we do it in the New Testament pattern, nothing else is expected of me. 
That's part of it. That's, 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 it's vital. But we cannot get it in our minds that that is all of it or that's everything. Consider in the book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, when you tie in worship and service and you think about how traditions of Christians can sometimes come about today. In the book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, what was going on is Amos, the minor prophet, was the, the, the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, they're about to go into Assyrian captivity. And this, this prophet from Tekoa, he, he said, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a prophet, nor am I a son of a prophet. I'm a, I'm a farmer. Uh, I raise sheep. God sent him from the south, uh, from Tekoa, uh, into the north to go and prophesy and condemn the people of Israel. And God through Amos says, I hate your feast days. I despise your feast days. Their traditions were causing them to believe that as long as we sacrifice, we can do anything else. Well, the mindset can be there today in Christianity if we're not careful. As long as I show up for church a couple of hours on Sunday... It doesn't really matter what else I do during the week. Well, let's notice our last three passages of Scripture in the New Testament. First of all, 1 Timothy. Again, we could go on and on about God expects something from us, James chapter 1 and 2 especially. But notice just three examples. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety or godliness or respect or reverence at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone, trust in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. We need to make sure our traditions are not keeping us from our responsibilities, taking care of family. First and foremost, on family. And then if there's none there to do it, the church stepping in as we see in James, 1 Timothy chapter 5. James chapter 1, uh, verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and the orphans. In Romans chapter 14 and verse 19, we're to edify one another, we're to encourage one another. Certainly we do that when we come together for worship and Bible study, but it's not limited to these times. So much that we do outside of these walls to encourage and edify one another when we call we check on one another, we stop by for a visit or whatever we might be able to do. Going back to our text, Matthew 15 and Mark 7, Jesus was condemning this group who were coming up with their own traditions, making the word of God, the commands of God of no effect, binding what they wanted to bind. We're, we can be very much like them. Many people are. If we're not careful, we will. Individually and as a congregation, we need to continue to do that checkup using the Word of God as a self-examination and make sure that we don't bind traditions, but also we're not falling short of the Bible or going beyond the Bible. And what is taught, what is practiced, what is required, and all of it has a thus saith the Lord in proper context. We're going to turn our services back over to Jason as he's going to lead us in the song of encouragement. And we would encourage you, if you have opportunity at, uh, at this time, if, if you have desire at this time, certainly you have opportunity if you have a desire at this time to make a change in your life, we would hope that you would do so. It's not limited to this time. It can be at any time of the day or night, but we're never guaranteed the next hour. So we, we always want to make sure we remember uh, that life is like a vapor and it can be gone at any moment. And we want to encourage you as we sing this song to one another to do that self-examination. And if you're not in a faithful relationship with God according to the scriptures, we would love to help you to get where you need to be, to study with you, to help you put on Christ as a believer repenting of your sins as you do so in baptism, or to return and ask God for forgiveness as you come repenting as a baptized believer. We would... We'd love to help everyone here go to heaven. That's, that's why we're here, to help one another go to heaven. If we can help you to go to heaven this morning, please come as we stand and as we sing.